Okay, so we are starting the sessions on the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. We have covered the Patanjali Yoga Sutras before, but in our earlier sessions it was basically only about the essential sutras and in these sessions to follow we will be covering all the sutras so we will be doing very detailed sessions i do not know exactly how long this will take but i am presuming that we will need between 30 to 40 sessions for detailed version of the yoga sutras and we will be doing this every friday of course we will be taking breaks like in summer and winter breaks that we generally do so um, this can take um, perhaps up to the end of this year possibly so we start with the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. The first question is, who is Patanjali? A lot of people do not know who Patanjali is. And the reality is, the truth is that even historians and scholars and academicians those who have studied Indian philosophy and the Indian darshans, as they are called, the seven systems of philosophy, do not really know who Patanjali was. It is possible that he was a single individual, but it is also possible that Patanjali is a family name. So it is not very clear. Sometimes there has been Suggestions have been made that Patanjali was the same as Panini, who was a well-known grammarian. He, 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 was, he studied the languages, grammar, especially Sanskrit grammar. And however, there is no clear evidence to, to prove this claim. Most important, however, is to know that Patanjali is not the founder of yoga. He did not invent yoga. A lot of people believe that, like Buddh, like Gautam Buddh was the founder of Buddh religion or Buddh dharma, that Patanjali was the inventor of yoga. He was not. He did not invent yoga. Yoga was not invented or created or discovered by a single individual. While the term yoga has been found even in the Vedas, it was used differently. Yet there's reason to believe that yoga practices and yoga existed long before Patanjali. He, he is said to have lived or written this work any time between 200 BC and 200 AD. So it's a very, very large span of 400 years. It's not very clear when he lived, if he was a single individual. So yoga existed long before. What Patanjali did and what the Yoga Sutras present here is a systemized work on yoga. He was the codifier of yoga. He arranged it in a systematic form, which lifted this into a science. Before that, it was unstructured, different lineages, different teachers practicing, different techniques. And this work is a comprehensive study 
and gives it then, raises it to the level of a science. So what are the Yoga Sutras made of? You can see already here that there's chapter one, which is Samadhi Pada, is called On Concentration. That's the first chapter. There are four chapters. Pada means chapter in literally, actually. Pada means foot or a footstep. This is to suggest that the entire text is like footsteps. You go from one step to the other, gradually further, deeper into the matter. It comprises of sutras, 196, in some versions, 197 sutras. The extra sutra is not really very relevant here. But the sutras are pithy statements or aphorisms. They are single lines, like the very first sutra. Now the study of yoga begins. Some of them are as short as this. Some are a little bit longer. But it is made up of these 196 statements. Why is it in this form? These are only 196 lines or statements divided into four parts. For that, we need to understand the background. The background is that we're talking about a text that was written around 2000 years ago. You are well aware that there were no printing presses at that time. So you had a big problem. How would you transfer knowledge? One of the ways that was very common in India at that time was the idea of sutras. It's like making notes when you attend a lecture, you take notes and you have points and these points help you understand the gist of the subject. So it's like taking notes. It serves as a mnemonic. It helps you to remember or memorize this knowledge. This has led to a lot of modern students memorizing the Yoga Sutras, but that's not how it was done in those days. It was not memorized in that sense. It may have been, but that was not the, the only purpose. The idea was to get the juice of the gist of this knowledge, to integrate this, and that assisted in transfer of knowledge. This was handed down then from teacher to student. The word sutra actually means thread. Sutra is a thread. Now the entire Yoga Sutras, as I mentioned earlier, are, are synthesis. It synthesizes the entire science of yoga. It is also an analysis of the mind, with the process of meditation. How do you get from certain yogic experience to the highest state of kevalya or total liberation? So it analyzes this process. It synthesizes this into a science. And it does it in the sutra form. And sutra means a thread. So there's a second meaning of sutra. It doesn't mean just a pithy statement. It also means the thread 
that goes through all the 196 statements. So imagine this as going through each logically making sense. So one statement leads to the next, which leads to the third, and it makes logical sense. And it is this sutra or the strain of thoughts which we must keep in mind. Do not get lost in the details. Do not get lost in each sutra and the detailed analysis and the Sanskrit and the academic discussions and the intellectual debates. If you do, you will be lost. What is far more important in the reading of the Yoga Sutras is the overview. That's the big picture. Keep the big picture in mind. I will try throughout these sessions to remind you of that big picture every now and then to make you aware of it, that you do not get lost in the details. It's the nature of a subject that is very complex and perhaps even complicated to the modern student because the language used is different. So what happens is many modern students of yoga learn the sutras by heart. In reality, that is a complete waste of time. These are not mantras. This is not mantra yoga, where you're chanting something. It is meant to be a study of the mind. And since the sutras are written in this form, like taking notes, obviously certain parts are missing. It's like when you attended a lecture in school or college at university, you took notes. You did not perhaps <laughs> memorize the entire lecture or take detailed notes where you were just writing down what the professor said. So these notes made only sense if you attended the lecture. So also the Yoga Sutras make only sense when accompanied by guidance from a teacher of a living tradition, because that is what it's about. It's about a living tradition and the focus is the relationship between the teacher and student. Only as a teacher who has meditated, has experienced these different states of consciousness that are described here, will understand and will be able to transfer that knowledge to the student. Otherwise, it becomes an intellectual study. It becomes a scholarly study or um, it turns into debates. That's what generally happens. Because of the nature of this text being complex, being even complicated, there have been very, very uh, poor translations because these translations were made generally by scholars. They were academic translations. The language is very difficult to follow. And the commentaries were often written by scholars and by intellectuals. And if they were in Sanskrit and then translated or in, from Indian languages translated, the translations were also very poor. The translations were also made, about, again, by scholars. So when scholars and 
academicians started to do these kind of translations, the result was they, they just did not understand these states of consciousness that were being described. They did not understand the so-called super power, super normal powers, the siddhis that were being described. And it's made the study even more difficult. There have been commentaries written on the commentaries which are written on the commentaries. This has become really uh, a serious problem for anybody wishing to study the Yoga Sutras. So for whom are the Yoga Sutras meant? In reality, the Yoga Sutras when they were put down or put together, they were meant for edits, for accomplished teachers and their highly advanced students, students who were studying the mind. They were not studying the Yoga Sutras. Please remember this. The students were studying the mind. They were not studying the Yoga Sutras. The Yoga Sutras were an aid to these students. It systematized that what they were going through and it helped them understand what they were experiencing. Think of it like a map. If you want to go from Delhi to London, you need a map. Of course, okay, maybe that's not the best example, but from any town to another, you need a map. And if you're going by car, you realize that the map is very useful. But if you just study maps without actually going, it seems to be a completely pointless exercise. You don't understand the terrain. You, you don't, it makes no, not, not much sense. But when you get into the car and drive or when you walk, you begin to understand that map makes sense. So the Yoga Sutras are a map for those people who are studying the mind. If you're not observing the mind, if you're not a meditator, if you're not a part of a lineage and you're not being guided by a teacher who is a part of a meditative lineage, then you will find this study very difficult. All the same, a lot of modern students like to study the Yoga Sutras. Much has been spoken about the Yoga Sutras. They have become popular, people want to know about it. So it is natural that modern students are curious. I have made an effort with these sessions to make the Yoga Sutra easy. Easy does not mean simple. It's easy reading. I have used simple English to convey the Yoga Sutras for the simple reason that when we use the kind of academic language that the other translations use, it makes it even more difficult to understand an already difficult topic. I have translated this myself and um, I have done that earlier as well for the Essential Yoga Sutras that we did earlier. And I had always resisted um, talking about chapter three and four because they seem so esoteric uh, for modern students, but I have done them. And this translation, I hope 
at least makes the study of the sutras a little bit easier than it otherwise would be. Any questions so far? General questions regarding the history or the overall understanding before we dive into the sutras. Atika ji? Yes. If we had participated in the sessions that you led on the essential yoga sutras, what would be your hope that we would gain from these that are you know, different. I, I know you mentioned the chapters three and four, but mm. meaning, th does my question make sense? <laughs> yes. When I did the essential yoga sutras, I wanted to keep it really very practical. And it's not that the detailed session will not be practical, but chapters three and four will be challenging. Not, not to me, <laughs> they will be challenging for those who are listening and watching uh, because some of the ideas there are a bit incredible. For those who have not studied the mind, not observed it, not meditated, it requires a certain amount of um, faith, almost I would say, since these are experiences that the average person does not have. And I think that by going into it in detail, one does, if it is not an intellectual exercise, one does learn to appreciate the overview. The sutras are the overview of the whole system. Mostly modern students get stuck on the physical aspect. And they don't really know how to observe. They don't know really how to meditate. And they don't really want to have guidance. With this entire study, with all of this, with all four chapters, if you get something out of the overview, you begin to see the, the train or the, the thread that passes through the entire text you will get something out of it. It will be an inspiration. It will be something you can aspire for. And it makes you also realize that it's not something that only some mysterious advanced yogis that you are never even going to ever see can accomplish this, but you cannot. It makes it just a little bit more reachable. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope so. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, which is also why I keep saying I have tried to keep it simple. It's not a simple topic. It's complex. But I've tried to keep the language easy, simple, and I hope um, it works. I know that as we proceed, there will be a point of time where we will have some difficulties, and it's also very dense. There's so much information in just a few sutras. Some of the sutras are so packed, so dense, that you really need to sometimes, you know, almost sleep over it. Just give your mind time to integrate it. So go gently with it. Don't get um impatient with yourself if you don't understand everything that's probably the case for everybody else as well and try when we are going through this to relate also to yourself observe try to observe some of these things which we talk about about the mind in your own mind related to your own mind and that will make it 
much easier to follow. So, the first chapter is called Samadhi Pada on concentration, but most of you know that Samadhi is in fact the very last limb of Ashtang Yoga. The very last, which means the highest, or that what we aspire for. So, why does why do the Yoga Sutra begin with Samadhi Pada? That is quite like, you know, diving into the deep end. The very first word here of the very first Sutra is now. In Sanskrit is Atha. Atha Yoga Anusashanam, that means now the study of yoga begins. This word now has led to a great deal of philosophical speculation. A lot of commentators have said, oh, this means you have to live in the now. This is the way it begins, that means... It is a philosophical kind of statement or it is encouraging you to live in the present moment. Well, if you see the way the Yoga Sutras are written, they are written in a very point-wise manner. So in a point-wise system, when you take notes, for example, you generally stick to the topic. You, you don't start trying to make some sort of symbolic uh, statement there. So that does not seem quite the right reason for this. So what is now about? Well, think about it. Whenever we talk about the word now, when we, we have said something before and then you say, and now let's begin this. So something happened before. We did all this, and now let's do this. So now indicates that something happened before. What happened before? Why does it begin with Samadhi Pada? Why does it begin with this? Simple answer. The teacher, the student, have gone through a process before. Or the reader, the student, has had some glimpses which have made him curious about the nature of the mind. What could that possibly be? For somebody who has not had systematic guidance into a very systematic approach to meditation, there could be a spontaneous mystical state arising. This can happen to anybody, anytime. A spontaneous mystical experience, which changes the way you look at the world. You become curious about the world as well as the mind. You become very self-observant. So either such an experience has happened to a student who has now become curious and wants to study the nature of the mind, or Teacher and student together have gone through this process. The student is observing his own mind in detailed or regular practice. And through this experience, he is beginning to study the nature of his mind. And that is why the teacher, you can imagine the teacher saying to the student, and now the study of yoga begins. 
you have experienced something, you've got some glimpses, and now the study of yoga begins. Not before. Which is why it is a shame that a lot of modern students start the intellectual study of the Yoga Sutras and other texts without having had any practical experience. Which makes the study purely intellectual, very theoretical and very, very complicated. It seems almost then that there is a competition to see who can write the most difficult commentary, who can claim to understand some complicated um, academic scholarly writings. So that is why now the study of yoga begins. It is really for those students who have had some deeper mystical experience or those who are in the process of studying and observing the mind. Therefore, one must study the mind or observe the mind in order to understand the Yoga Sutras. One doesn't really study the Yoga Sutras. In reality, you study the mind. Any questions so far? In that case, I will continue. These are the sutras 2, 3 and 4 of chapter 1. I have translated them, as you can see, in a very simple English and hopefully that will make much more sense. When that high state of consciousness is attained, where thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires naturally and spontaneously subside without any forceful suppression, this state is called yoga. This sutra, 1.2, answers the question, what is yoga? In most translations, they use words like modifications of the mind, fluctuations in the mind. And this is not very clear because when we think of our mind, we don't think of modifications in it or of fluctuations. It sounds, fluctuation sounds like somebody is very moody or has different moods. And modification, that's such a strange word. It's not really something you associate with the mind. The mind is, if you observe, any normal person observes the mind, you will say immediately, in the mind there are thoughts, there is a stream of images, whether it's dreams or fantasies or memories, there are emotions, you can have sadness, joy, love, pain, all sorts of emotions and desires. We all have desires. All this is what the mind is made up of. So when these subside, but without any forceful suppression, it's very important to understand that this is without forceful suppression. If there is a suppression where you say, oh, I have no thoughts, I have no images, I have no emotions and I have no desires. 
then I'd say, well, then you must be dead. Because everybody has this. But in the process of meditation, these can spontaneously subside. That is a long process of purification. And it is only then that we acquire the state of yoga. So those modern students, beginners who say, oh, I have no thoughts. I sit in meditation and I have no thoughts. That is highly doubtful. What is probably happening is suppression. So I will read that again. When the state of consciousness is attained, where thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires naturally and spontaneously subside without any forceful suppression, this state is called yoga. And when this occurs, pure consciousness shines forth. And you know that you are one with the infinite whole, a wave of bliss and beauty in the vast ocean of consciousness. So what happens when the mind subsides, when thoughts, images, emotions, desires, when that all subsides, what comes forth, consciousness shines forth. And then you have the experience where you know you are one with the infinite whole. You're all aware of the diagram that we often look at, and that is the diagram where we have the mind, conscious mind, latent, un um, active unconscious and latent unconscious. And behind that is pure consciousness. And this is what shines forth because the mind has subsided. It's like a lake. Think of a lake. And when there are no ripples, there's no disturbance, you can see through right to the bottom. So then you know you are pure consciousness. So this is when the state of yoga is attained. But what happens otherwise? At all other times, however, we are disturbed by our thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires. We identify ourselves with these, mistaking our thoughts, mental images, emotions, and desires for ourselves, when in fact we are none other than pure consciousness. So, most of the time what's happening, we are disturbed by these thoughts. Somehow, some, somewhere, a bubble comes up, a mental image, maybe some memory from the past. Maybe a thought about your old girlfriend or boyfriend 20 years later. That memory comes up and it disturbs you because hmm, maybe there's a part which is still thinking, hmm, what if it would have worked? That would be with this person. So that memory, that image disturbed. And this is happening all the time. There is something or the other coming in front of us. And this creates thoughts, other images, emotions, which are very powerful, and desires, which are also very, very basic to our nature. We identify with these. We get attached to these. You may get attached to a certain thought. And then it's hard to let go. Parents, for example, get attached to their children and they think, oh, these children are going to need me all their life. And then when they become teenagers or grow up, it's very hard for us to let go because we identify with 
parenthood or with motherhood or fatherhood. It's the same thing with our spouses or our close family. You get attached to certain ideas, thoughts, and then you start identifying with those. You even get attached to, to certain things, like your car. You have a mental image of yourself driving a fancy car, and you get attached to that idea. And if you don't have a car, or the car is banged up in an accident, you're shattered. You get disturbed. So all the time, these things come forward in the form of thoughts, images, emotions, desires. And imagine this lake is full of ripples all the time. Everywhere there are ripples. There are smaller ripples. There are bigger ripples. Everywhere there are ripples. You cannot see what the bottom of the lake looks like. So we think we are the thoughts. We think that we are certain desires. We associate with these. When in reality, we are not these. We are, in fact, pure consciousness. Any questions about these? These first four sutras are really the core of the Yoga Sutras. They explain what is yoga. If you read any academic version of this, you will not understand it at all. It makes no sense. It's very complicated the way they are written. Some of them are even misleading. For example, one says, yoga is a suppression of the modifications of the mind. Well, the word suppression leads to a completely different idea. It leads the, or misleads rather, the student to thinking that I have to stop thinking. I don't have to think, thoughts are bad, and so are emotions and desires. So let me pretend not to have these thoughts and images and desires. So, so many of these translations are misleading because they are academic translations. So I prefer the word subside, subside naturally, when these, the word modification, I already said that, that really doesn't suit um, the subject here. We're talking about the mind and Any question? Yeah. When you mentioned about uh, study of mind, uh, yeah. does it indicate uh, the habit patterns, uh, desires, active and latent desires? Yes, yes, exactly. This is habits, thinking habits, behavioral habit patterns. It's not referring to habits as in ritual habits in the sense of you get up in the morning and uh, you brush your teeth. It's referring to habits as in thinking and behavioral, emotional uh, habit patterns as well. Because we are made up of nothing other than habits. Habits is just an English word for certain um, ways of thinking that have been reinforced. We have learned these ways of thinking and we keep repeating them. We have learned certain ways of behavior and we keep repeating that. And so the habits 
are actually the thoughts. So that is what it's referring to. The observation of this is not merely in the daily life. It's not like you were doing some sort of uh, meditation in action, but it is referring to practice where you go from gross to subtle, where you sit down in your seat and you have a focal point and then you observe that, you watch it, and in the process, the mind also reveals its true nature. And that's the process of observation we are talking about here. Yeah. Okay. Also, when you mentioned about thoughts, mental images, emotions, and desires, so mm -hmm. are these arising from chitta? Yes, everything arises from chitta. Actually, chitta is, everything is chitta. We analyze it, it's a science, it's a yogic science, so we analyze this and we say that the chitta is divided into four aspects. Then we say this is manas, buddhi, angara, and then there's chitta, which is a memory. It's like the body. We have one body, <laughs> but we have analyzed that the body is made up of a head, there's a torso, there are two upper limbs, two lower limbs. So we have divided the body into parts. In reality, you have only one body, right? So similarly, the mind is made up of chitta, but we have analyzed it. It is a science, so we have created these ideas. It's not like there are four compartments. These are just ways of looking at the mind. Okay. Did you want to say something, Shanta? No, it's okay. All right. I was following the what, what, whatever you were saying. I was following it. Okay. Good. Also, uh, one more question, uh, mm -hmm. Anika. Oh, yeah. One more clarification. When you yeah. said uh, subside, uh, spontaneous subside, when, without any forceful suppression. Mm -hmm. If 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 a meditator get some, uh, maybe uh, if there is a uh, desire that has been subsided, which he could see it on his, you know, uh, in his daily life, mm -hmm. uh, does it show or indicates that there is some, that part of it is purified or in the process of purification? Yes, yes. Here, um, it can have two meanings. Subside is Imagine during the process of meditation itself, not in daily life, right now we're talking about meditation. You can imagine it like a stream. You know, it's like a stream of water which is running. There's a lot of water flowing. And it's a hot summer, so suddenly the stream dries. You know, the stream just dries slowly. So imagine that the stream of mental images, emotions, desires, you're sitting in meditation, you have a focal point, but there's, these come forward. But suddenly you find it all becomes quiet and just for maybe a few moments, pure consciousness shines forth. Now what you are referring to is maybe more in daily life where you may find that a certain desire has subsided. That is called attenuation. That comes later, we will study that as well. That comes um, these are the different kind of glaciers and yes, here they are. These are the different colorings of glaciers which are latent, attenuated, interrupted, and active. And so what you are talking about is attenuated here. These are the colorings. That means in daily life, you will start observing that maybe you are not so attached to a certain idea anymore. So if you have, say, a great attachment to your job or to your position or your title at work, 
you may find that with regular meditation, a certain degree of attach, detachment has now appeared in your life. So this coloring, this thought, this one particular thought about your job is now not so strong anymore. It has attenuated. So here, what we are talking right in the beginning of the state of yoga is slightly different from what the example you have given. So you are giving the example of the coloring or the glaciers. And we will come to that in our next sessions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. so this is exactly now what you talked about. Um, that basically there are two kinds of thoughts. So the sutras 1.5 to 1.11 talk about uncoloring your thoughts. So we have these thoughts and they're very strong. Some of them, they keep coming again and again. They disturb us. Like I said, your attachment to your job. If you think you're going to lose your job, you get very, very disturbed, very upset. Or you have attachment to your <laughs> ex-girlfriend or boyfriend, somebody from your past, and that you can't somehow let go and that keeps coming back and disturbing you. Or you have attachment to your son or daughter who has now grown up and you find that you can't let go. So that is a colored thought. It's very heavy or it's colored. It's tainted, actually. The word klesha means like tainted. So thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires disturb us like ripples that disturb the clear surface of a lake. And these ripples are of twofold nature. So all these thoughts, whatever, now we are using a general word called ripples. The word used in the Yoga Sutras is vritti. There is no real translation for that. Academics have said, okay, vritti is again thoughts, but it's more than just thoughts. So vritti is a ripple in the mind. It could be a thought, it could be emotion, it could be a mental image, it could be many of these things. So these vrittis or ripples are either colored or not colored. Mostly they are colored. This second category of not colored is basically for those who are going through this process of purification, who are meditating. For everybody else, their thoughts are colored. So colored thoughts, images, emotions, desires, lead us to the false belief that worldly objects give us everlasting pleasure. These colored thoughts, feelings, desires, cause us to mistake misery as happiness. They make us believe that our body and mind is our true nature and they take us away from pure consciousness. And we strengthen and perpetuate this false belief system. Imagine an emotion. You have maybe jealousy, very possessive about somebody, you know, a person who you sort of have a deep attachment to. Now, what happens when you have something like jealousy? This will cause us a lot of misery, right? And you think, you have that false belief that this person is, is going to give me happiness. But in fact, it's quite the opposite. So we begin to think that that misery is going to be happiness. It's not. This attachment, this false belief, also makes us believe that our body and mind is our true nature. We think that's it. There is nothing more. 
some people do have the realization that there is something more to than the body. They come to the mind and they say, okay, yes, there's the mind. It's finer, subtler. But they have not come to that realization that there's something deeper than the mind, that there is consciousness. So all these people remain on this level of body and mind. And they think that that's it. This is all that there is to it. And that false belief is perpetuated. It becomes stronger with these colored thoughts. The uncolored thoughts, on the other hand, are those that lead away from this false belief and it promotes the direct experience of our true nature, which is none other than pure consciousness. So not colored or uncolored thoughts are when you see things as they are. If I have a pen in my hand, and it's a very nice pen here. And I look at this pen and I think, oh, this is my pen. And if somebody takes away my pen, I get very, I, I don't get upset, but I say, hey, make sure you return my pen. <laughs> because there's an attachment. Then maybe the attachment is not so strong. It's not a very expensive pen. But I also have here my iPhone. Now, if somebody would take my iPhone, I would immediately get a little bit alert. Alert is the way I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm upset still, but I get alert. And I say, why are you taking my iPhone? <laughs> and that is a colored thought. So you see the difference between the pen and the iPhone? There was a difference. I'm not so colored about the pen because it's just a very cheap, ordinary pen. It's not an expensive pen. But I am very colored about the iPhone. So this is how the mind operates. We have coloring every object around us. And you can do that exercise right now you look around you and you will find, wherever you are, you will find objects that you are colored about. You could be sitting right now with your own mobile phone uh, or your, your laptop and think, hey, yeah, that's an, that's an important thing. Without the mobile phone these days, you cannot function. And there is a coloring there. If I would take away your mobile phone and just throw it out of the house, out of the window, you're going to get very angry and very upset because it is colored. And I know that some of you are thinking, yes, of course I would. It's not that I'm attached, but it's expensive and I paid so much for it and I need it. And it's a need thing. It's not about desire, but it is. It is also that. There is an attachment. So that's the difference between colored and not colored thoughts. Any questions on that? On colored and not colored thoughts? The technical word for those who are interested is klishta and eklishta. Klishta is colored thoughts. And eklishta is not colored thoughts. You can understand now how the study of the Yoga Sutras can help a person who is meditating because you will look at your thoughts when they come forward to disturb you during meditation and ask, hey, why is this disturbing me? And you say, oh, it's colored. It's a klishta thought. And how colored is it? I have another thought as well. Is it more colored than this thought? 
So it helps you to know your mind, to study your mind, which will eventually help you to go beyond your mind. For those who believe that they can skip the mind completely and just go directly to pure consciousness, that is not possible. We need to go through this and become conscious because that is the way to total liberation, Kaivalya. We will be doing that, but that comes right away later in chapter 3, the end of chapter 3. So that's where the journey will take us. Okay, any questions before we end this session? Okay. There don't seem to be any questions. In that case, Radhika. yes. Radhika, it's not colored thoughts, aklishta thoughts, mm -hmm. mental images, uh, emotions, and desires. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something I am unable to really get a hold of it. Yeah. Hmm. Let me put it this way: if something would happen to your son or your daughter, you would be very upset, right? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. You would be worried if they would come very late from school. You would start worrying, why are they not there? What has happened? Your mind might create images like, things like, oh, have they been kidnapped or have they got hurt? Has there been an accident? Yes, I thought. Now, let's say the neighbor's children have not come. Somebody you don't know at all. Will you be as affected? No, you will not be. Maybe it's a person somewhere living in another country altogether. Something happens. Are you so upset about it? Are you involved? No. So that thought, you can look at that image or that thought. You may read it in the news. Something happened. We read it all the time. If you read the news, it's full of all sorts of disasters, but we don't get upset. We may get upset if you are somehow connected. You read in the newspaper, there was a terror attack somewhere, but you don't know anybody, you are not connected to that country, then it doesn't bother you so much. But if the terror attack would be in your hometown, then you would be affected. So, a cluster is where you have no coloring. You have no coloring because you don't have a connection to that town or to those people. So, okay. that's how you can understand the difference between the two. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. So, thank you everybody for joining us. We will, we will continue next time with a very interesting study observing the mind and understanding how the mind operates. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika Ji. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.